Hey, I'm back again to do my thing. Read the book entitled In the Shadow of the Great White Wall, written by me. And it, uh, I think it's an alright book. You know, personally, I am biased, but I like it. I think it's an excellent, excellent bit of literature. Just do okay. I'm sorry, it's hard to say things with a straight face when you're talking crap. But anyway, I love my book. I think it's great. I love the first one, but you know, I'm biased. Hopefully people come by tonight and they know that I'm reading tonight, not tomorrow. I tried to fix that on Facebook. I'm going to run this for a little bit before I start reading because usually I have a couple people show up in a minute or two. Um, if not, I'll just start reading and uh, it'll be on YouTube and Facebook and people can watch the video afterwards. It's, uh, it's alright, either way. I don't care. I get to escape into my little book, having a hard day and... Uh, Everyone's having a hard day with this COVID crap. I said the word. Anyway, I hate that word. It's on the news all the time. So anyway, yeah, I despise that word. And, well, I'm going to pretend it's not happening and read my book and live in a different world that's going through freaking crap. So anyway, it doesn't look like anybody's showing up tonight. Maybe everybody thought I was going to do it tomorrow. I hope not. But, you know, hey, cool. Either way, it's all good. I do what I want. I'm reading my book online, and people can just watch it later if they want. All right, got to put my goggles on so that I can see the words in the pages. All right, so this book is known as the Sh In the Shadow of the Great White Wall. It is a sequel to uh, The Champion of the Golden Queen, which was released a couple of years ago, and this one was released last year, or in 2019 anyway uh, which I guess is last year but not really over a year ago it's coming up on a year um, if you're interested in buying a copy the print copies are a little screwed up right now because the printers aren't printing because of the thing that I said about the name of earlier that I don't like to say and they're not printing because well I don't know maybe they're not in a central business or something so anyway they're on hold so if you order a, a print book from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever the other places are and you don't get it it doesn't show it's in stock I can't guarantee you're not gonna have to wait a month or two for Ingram Spark my uh, my publisher to figure out what's going on hello whoever showed up I'm you know happy that you're here hopefully that you're here to listen to me read this book and if not I'm just glad for you, glad for you just to show up and say hi um, other than that, uh, if you want the books, uh, Champion and Shadow are both on Amazon, on a Kindle, they're on Barnes & Noble for the Nook, and they're on, uh, what do you call it, Apple Books. You can also get them, I guess, overseas, wherever they sell the, I don't know, the, what's the word, the generic ebook format. They have that too, the Moby format somewhere, I'm sure. The publisher gets it out to all the outlets, so just look it up. In the shadow of the great white wall. Anyway, that's the three minutes of me rambling on about where you can buy the book. It looks like this. I'm going into chapter three now. So hopefully uh, some folks show up and give me some interaction. If not, I hope you guys check out check it out later on the video and uh, let me know what you think. So in the first chapters, the first pro in the prologue, you saw that the world's all messed up. And Purin and Adasser inherited this disaster area and there's civil wars all the way around the Southlands. There's three co three countries at war right now. There's um, there's Sinog, Sudanyag, and Hodon is kind of in the middle of all this, but they're not really at war. <coughs> but uh, Sudan, uh, Sudanyag, the Sudan are constantly at war. They have a uh, they have a syndicate that they're that's running their whole business, their whole government. So basically, they have the underground mafia of the Bedouin basically running Sudanyag and in Sinog there's a whole bunch of political strife different people claiming the throne even though there's no secured line at, that people can verify yet and so some dude just pops up and says I'm Lord so and so and I'm in line for the king I was the king's cousin sister's aunt's roommate and they get a militia together and they try to take over the world at least Sinog they don't want to mess with Islandeth or Hodon which are now allied first time in history of, of uh, mankind on the earth in my books have the Hodon and uh, and Islandeth people been allies vice uh, what do you call it uh, 
rivals and constantly at war, basically Cold War or at war at all times. So, basically they've identified a problem with the repatriation of the elves and the dwarves to their homelands. The humans are becoming a bunch of racist jerks and kicking people out of their uh, villages if they're half elf or half, half dwarf. Um, and they're, these people are running out into the wilderness because after the big war there's all sorts of open spaces and they're building their own villages here and there and well they're doing their thing they're building you know building their buildings building their crops they're building their own uh, what else settlements because they can't live in the uh, the lands of the humans because the humans won't leave them alone well Purin has a problem with that because he's married to an children are half elf and he's worried about their safety in this new bigoted crazy world that's been you know created by the repatriation of the elves and the dwarves uh, so after Purin gets to Empire uh, they're going to select uh, teams to go out and try to deal with the challenges of this new political landscape so basically he they had just arrived in the capital of Islandeth, which is named Empir, and the castle's a wreck, so they're staying in a couple of small bedrooms. They have a small throne room that's basically put together just for ceremonial reasons, but the actual castle's not rebuilt. The city walls are barely rebuilt, and the in the infrastructure of Empir is not back yet. Donic is a master uh, of the Order of Hyasdan, which is the religion based on the goddess Haya, who's the, the goddess of, of light and life. Her husband, Hyldren, is basically the god of the underworld, or you, I guess you can modern, you can call him the devil. He's a bad guy. But they were married at one time, and the whole mess that's going on in this world is because Hyldren and Haya are constantly trying to either destroy everything, or, or, or she's trying to put things back together. So, alright. Purin has gone to bed after he drank a few meads with his friend Donic, who he's known since the last book. And uh, uh, Adasser and Alari, her, his, her, their son, who is going to the monastery for training, is uh, basically they've gone to bed. So next day, all right, chapter three. Kairoth was an earnest man. At 16 years of age, he had found his way to Empire under the order of the king for conscription into the Islandic uh, military. He was less than enthused. It was his duty, but in reality, he knew he had no other place to go. He sat in the segregated encampment in a red tent, waiting for the examiners. He knew what was coming. He had been chosen, and he was pleased to finally get his chance to prove himself. Kairoth was born of an Island woman, but his father was Hodon. Before the Great War, he had lived just south of the Islandeth border with his father and mother. He was now 18 years of age, but remembered the attacks like they were yesterday. The young man's face turned to stone as he remembered his father's valiant stand against overwhelming, overwhelming odds, recall, recalling how the man single-handedly dispatched two orcs, a goblin, and two, de de two, de two Todesan warriors. Wow. I, I put a little tongue twisters in here. Before the cowards surrounded him with spears and summarily executed him. He watched with his mother from a crack on the floorboards. Kairoth and his mother hid in the escape space under the floor of their house as they hoped for a miracle that was not coming. When his father was killed, the two quietly crept out of the tunnel that was under the home to an escape hatch that was 50 feet from the house. There he could see the entire court, uh, countryside covered uh, by the enemy. They waited at the, as their house burned, breathing clean air, clean air from, the, from within the cover of the hidden door. Much later, when an opening in the en enemy forces was seen, Kairoth and his mother ran northward in an attempt to reach Islan. They were not the only ones. The plan was to use the cover of darkness and terrain to covertly make their way. But the Hodon did not know that the dark army saw better in the, the night than in the light, and the majority of those fleeing perished or were captured and made slaves. The mother of Kairoth would be no slave, nor would her son suffer that fate. She was, a, she was trained to be a Hodon warrior, as all the Hodon were required. In the end, she fought off two goblin scouts and an, an orc warrior before finally being subdued. Kairoth ran to assist, but his mother forbade him, shouting for him to run to the north. Spying a small copse of trees to the northwest, the young, ran, man, bleh, the young lad ran swiftly to the tree line, enemy in pursuit. Kairoth was a fast runner and an, and an agile scout at the age of 13. 
He was destined to become a Hodan elite, according to his father. The enemy could not keep up, but as he entered the border of the trees, the boys turned to see the enemy almost upon them, upon him. Then he saw them in action for the first time. Adaster's trees lashed out with a fury, letting the human pass freely within them. The orcs and goblins totaled maybe twenty or thirty pursuers. The trees swayed in unison, interlocking branches. They formed a bulwark as the enemy was stopped in their tracks, unable to enter. As the evil tried to push their way into the barrier, they were met with a gauntlet of spear tree, bran tree spear branches, tree branch spears, yeah, choking vines and, po and pounding log-sized boughs. The enemy forces did not even did not even miss those who had died before the tree line, but Kairoth would never forget them. The chattering of pretentious voices permeated the air. Young elfish girls doing parlor tricks to impress their peers within the blue tents. Saliabok, a young woman, a human woman from Edenyog, sat with her sister Sophia. They were not impressed. Glancing over at the overt display of natural talent, the two mages were miffed. Elves could perform magic tricks before birth, or uh, from birth, I should say, before birth, that'd be a neat trick, huh? Uh, from, from birth, but the two women had worked their whole lives to perfect their art. <laughs> Saliabok was about 20 years old when she arrived in Empire. She brought Sophia, who was three, year, three years her junior, along with her. The two, the two had or survived the, the war by the use of magic and had made their way to Edenyog when the war was over to study more. There they honed their skills until the call to arms in Empyr. Edenyog was gearing up for something, and both the sisters wanted nothing to do with it, so they departed to the, and headed north. I have to have a little medicine. Excuse me for a second while I have a little Irish whiskey. Go drink and drive, and all that happy stuff. I'm not going anywhere. We're stuck in the houses. It's Arizona. We're in the middle of the thing that shall not be named. All right, back to the story. Sally Abak was getting annoyed. So you got these elvish girls. They get a power when they're born. Like, they can rub their fingers together and make heat. All right, they make this heat, and they can set things on fire. Well, I got to type something so I don't lose my link. I'm going to... I want to answer myself. I'm talking to myself because I don't see anybody. If you're in a watch party and I don't see you on a different link, sorry I'm not talking to you, but I don't know you're there. <laughs> so if I'm talking to myself and you're really there, it's because I don't know. So anyway, like I was saying, these elvish girls, they get, they're get they born. They have some little power, you know, like say they can heat, you know, water up with their fingers or whatever. Well, then, you know, about, you know, five or ten years old, all of a sudden it's a flame on their finger and they can light fires with it or something, right? By the time their puberty hits, it, their power manifests, and all of a sudden they can hold a ball of fire in their hand, throw it at things, and kill people with it. It's because elfish women uh, are the mages in the elfish, uh, what do you call it, uh, society in my book. The men, they're more warriors or hunters or fishermen or priests or stuff like that. But the women, they get a random power when they're born. Well... Usually it's handed down from their mother or father or whoever, you know, they get the power from them. But anyway, these elvish girls are like, hee hee, look, look what I can do, how oh, I can do this magic thing. And these two human girls are watching them going, hey, you know, I had to spend two years to learn how to make fire, blah, 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 blah. And then they, they're kind of mad. So Saliabak is the older one. Older one. Saliabak is a mage who's pretty good at what she does. And her her sister is, uh, is uh, Sophia, which is the... The younger of the two, uh, she's 17, Sally Box 20, and they're in Edenyog, or actually Empire. They're from Edenyog. They're in Empire in the tents, getting ready to be chosen or, or screened for ch being chosen for the for the groups. So Sally Box was getting annoyed. The elves were becoming loud and obnoxious as they bragged about their superiority in the magic arts. One of them made an offhand remark in Elfish about Sophia being the spawn of a troll. There was a twitter of giggling among the uh, among several of the Elfish band. But Saliabak saw her sister frown and was not amused. The offender did not realize that both ladies were fluent in Elvish. The elder sister responded with in a scathing retort, At least my sister was not one of their whores. The Elvish circle was stunned to silent. silence. What did you say? questioned the offender in Elvish. Saliabak muttered to herself, touching her sister's shoulder. Gardus Magi Fortis, an, an invisible shield covered her, her and her sister. I said you were the evening sport, 
I said you are the evening sport of large, smelly offlander invaders. I would wager that your mother may have been defiled by one creating one such as yourself, Toad. Toad was a derogatory term for Todesson. The human race had names for everyone. The elf was enraged. She faced the human squarely, increasing the size of her fireball. Saliabok noted the increase, but acted as if she was not concerned in the least. Again, the human mage muttered something to herself. Sophia giggled, hearing the words. The elf then cast her fa fireball. It hit Sophia squarely, then shattered, sending shards of burning matter in all directions. Everyone in the tent began running out of the front flap as the shelter began started to glow. Pathetic, Sophia remarked, looking at her sister smugly. Agreed, sister, Saliabak responded as, the, the cast, as she cast an energy bolt at the offending elf. I held back. No, kill, no need to kill the fool. The elf was knocked off her feet and disoriented. The tent was now engulfed in flames, and the two sisters sat calmly, remaining, uh, the, but the two sisters calmly remained inside, seemingly immune. The elf was not, and they both knew it. Sophia sighed. It would not be wise to let the elf die, even if the fire was her fault. Sophia grabbed the elf by her tunic vest and pulled her out of the door to a crowd of gathering onlookers. Salibak was now visibly annoyed. Wonderful. There goes our chances of getting out of the regular tents and into something more accommodating. She motioned to the elves, who now stood silent, tensely waiting for more. Take this person from me, Sophia droned as if bored. The two elfish ladies complied, bowing awkwardly, leaving, and leaving quickly. Off in the distance, the commotion did not go unnoticed. Master Donick had been drinking his morning tea while looking out of the window towards the courtyard. He smelled the burning tent and rushed to see what the matter was. There, there, the headmaster saw a testy exchange between two human women and a group of elves. One elf was unconscious. Mages, what can you do with them? Time to order another tent to be dyed. Annoyed, he returned to his perch and sat down, as he saw the morning guard showing up to restore order. Be careful, gentlemen, the headmaster remarked, chuckling to himself. <clears throat> Down in the sanctuary, while the headmaster lamented the loss of the tent, the monks and priests of the order had gathered for their morning prayers. The, rote, the, the rhythm of rote prayer and responsive worship could be heard in the direct vicinity of the main sanctuary building, where the monastery was, un, for, was under construction. The young priest, a, a young priest, knelt facing the building. He was not of the order, officially having only been, a, an, apprentice, been an apprentice to a local practitioner of the faith. He was a commoner, and only, in his, and only the elites and those who found favor were allowed within the walls of, or, of the Order of Hyas Dawn. Valtier prayed alone. Outside, he was earnest and, and sincere in his worship, but to his annoyance, he was not alone in the green tent. Hi, whoever shows up. How you doing? Uh, hey, what you doing? A younger man spoke in an annoyingly loud voice. Rolling his eyes, Valtier responded, Praying, what do you think I'm doing? Looking for worms? He glared at the young man who had a potted plant in his hand and was watering it. Well, at least worms are useful, the young man said with a half-smile. Do you priests actually believe that the goddess listens to all of your blathering, repetitive nonsense? The young man poured water from his skin into the pot, talking lovingly to his little bush. Damn you, Rainier, can you just afford me a short time of peace in the morning without your incessant commentary on the priesthood? Valtier stood. The moment was gone, and he was not amused. Hey, just saying, I worship, I worship Haya also, but sitting or kneeling while pleading without actions to back it up? What is that? That is not true worship in my eyes. He, he was not looking at Voltaire. He was looking at his bush and pruning dead leaves and sprouts from the plant. There, all better, my little green friend. Your only friend, Voltaire quipped sarcastically. Oh, that hurts, brother. Vernier laughed, hugging Voltaire. Uh, Valtier pushed him off gently, shaking his head, entering the green tent looking for his rations. He had known Rainier since the young man was born. They grew up playing together within the ring at Erinsir, living in relative peace. Despite their peaceful start, both remembered huddling in the castle basement fortress while the queen held off a dark invasion with a few drage. Valtier was fifteen years old at the time of the devastation, and Rainier was an impressionable twelve. <clears throat> From their births, both studied the, with the clergy, becoming literate, proficient, proficient apprentices, and very devout along the way. At twelve years old, however, Rainier would strike off on another path, leaving the priesthood to its own devices. <clears throat> and the page is stuck. He had witnessed her. In the fortress darkness awaiting their deaths, Rainier stood on a crate and watched a dasser ra uh, watch, and watched as a dasser raised a dead girl while scolding his son, her son's disobedience. I am going to drink. I need a drink. 
my tongue needs to chill out here. I'm stuttering extra bad tonight. Ah. In the fortress darkness, they awaited their deaths. Rainier stood on a crate and watched as a dasser raised a dead girl while scolding her son's disobedience. He watched as she tore an orc apart without touching him. Wide-eyed, the young man remembered the shock of watching her command the trees, animals, and insects to her will. <clears throat> he knew this was the order he wished to pursue. When he unexpectedly survived, he discovered that the queen had only Prince Alari as her student. Boldly, he petitioned his queen to take him as an apprentice, and impressed with his courage and audacity, Adasser decided to take the twelve-year-old in as her charge. In the beginning, he washed the chamber pots, cleaned the floors, and brought the queen what she needed. As Valtir mocked him, Adasser continued to test Rainier's resolve, and she, and she was quietly pleased that her apprentice never waned in his fervor to learn, watching her every move, and noting everything that she did. Adasser could tell that her son Alari was a bit jealous, but the two boys got along well enough, and Rainier always seemed to know his place. <clears throat> Valtir emerged from the mildewed tent with two pieces of hardtack, a couple of slices of hard cheese and a small decanter of hot tea. He motioned to Rainier to come come over. Smiling, Rainier arrived. Oh no, this is for me. I just wanted you to see how proper tea was brewed, Valtier said mockingly. Rainier crossed his arms. Truly, you are still offended, you woman. Rainier said, suppressing a laugh. I was going to give you some, you intolerable horse's ass, but not now. Valtier pretended to start picking up the food and leave, but then began laughing loudly. Ass, sit down, Rainier complied. Brother... Perhaps today they will choose to choose us to serve the queen and her cause. There we can put our put actions to both our words and truly please the goddess. Rainier stared off in the sky in an apparent dream of glory. Perhaps we should be careful what we wish for, brother, Valtier said, stuffing bread into his mouth. It seldom results in what we expect. Rainier ate, uh, nodded and ate. Valtier had never stirred him wrong. Purin arrived at Donick's door by the third hour of the morning. The king had, was equipped in full battle dress. Donak knew that this was to make an impression. The king was an imposing soul in regular attire, but in armor he could be downright terrifying depending upon which side you were on. <clears throat> Donak rose. Your majesty, I was going to come to you. He smiled, shaking his king's hand. You will never stop. We are not in public, brother. Formality is not required, Piran smiled, uh, replied smiling. Still, you are armed, and I am watching myself, Donak winked. Piran laughed, pulling up an armchair. So... What do we have, brother? The king asked, getting down to business. Well, I'm getting the list together. <clears throat> Apparently there was a dispute among the humans and elfish mages, and one elf was sent to the infirmary while a tent was burned to the ground. Donak was mildly annoyed. Well, bring those offenders to the trials. They seem to be somewhat proficient. Piran snorted. No one died. No deaths, but one, el but just an elfish ego squashed. Donak shook his head. Ooh. Human girls dispatched an elfish girl? Yes, bring those to the trials. The elf must be pu furious, pure and smirked. They are so proud of their gifts. She's not going She's not going anywhere for a while, brother. The human woman defeated her pretty soundly, from what I'm told. In, it was uh, in retaliation for the elf's initial attack. Two humans on one elf, but reportedly only one, he, one human responded. This could be interesting. Donick raised an eyebrow. Uh, definitely any human that can beat an elf at her own game. How old was the elf, Piran inquired. Report says seventy years, your majesty. Old enough to know better, Piran smiled. What of those warriors? We have several. One distinguishes himself. The name is Kairoth, of Hodon. A couple of strangers, another Hodon, and one lad from Impir. Then the usual lot. <clears throat> By far, the Kairoth lad is the most impressive, Donick paused. The, that boy sent five to the infirmary using wooden practice weapons, and they are unsure if one of the opponents will live. No restraint. Well, he is hold on, Piran sighed. I hope the injured one survives. They're so young, Donick. That they are, my king, the master remarked somberly. Oh, and I found a specialist, as you requ requested. Oh, excellent. Where, Piran asked, sipping some tea. Where else? Tied to the post, Donick shook his head. Oh, splendid. That post. How I hate that post, Piran grimaced angrily. What did he or she do? Stealing food from the military stores, he was also he also assaulted a guard to get him to get in, knocking him out, but not killing him. He could have, so I decided that he only got three la he only got three lashes. Donick waited for the king's reply. Is he still serviceable, or did we break him? Pure and furrowed his brow. He is healing, your Majesty. He will be well in a couple of days. That one is pretty tough. One of the reasons that I picked him. He says he's out of synagogue, but I'm not sure. He could be sued. 
Donick wrinkled his nose at the word. I'm clicking around just to make sure things don't happen. Uh, Pure and Shuka said, "Will you not? Will you never stop that?" Wait a minute. I lost something. I went somewhere and I'm not seeing where I lost. Hold on, sorry, I lost my spot. <sighs> okay, stealing food, blah blah blah. Uh, okay, here we go. Sudan or Islam matters not to me, as long as he is proficient and loyal to the cause. The king stated uh, firmly, rising and finishing his tea. Understood, Your Majesty. Well, I will assemble them later today for your inspection, if that is all right. Donak rose and bowed. Purin shook his head. You will never stop that, will you? Never, chosen one. You may be my brother and my king, but I am a monk and a priest, and you are touched by the gods. Donak hugged his king, and Purin hugged him back. Be well. I will see you later t today. You as well, my oldest friend. Purin left the room. All right, next scene. Donak went out to the uh, sent out the writs, and the chosen were informed of their new status. Orders were given to each of the prospects to report to the courtyard at the tenth hour of the day, clean and in clean clothing, and ready for inspection. Each of the members went to their separate laundries and washed their clothing. The warriors and the rangers tended to their weapons and armor, making last-minute repairs while cleaning them. All were prepared for the gathering by the eighth hour of the day. They spent the remainder of their free time collecting their pay from the quartermaster and eating at the field chicken kitchen. The field chicken? No, the field kitchen. The field kitchen. <laughs> it's hard to speak English sometimes. <clears throat> eating at the field kitchen in the main camp. Many of the regulars looked at the particular candidates with disdain, but everyone knew that they were supposed to be the best of the best. So they kept their distances and only made their remarks out of the range of hearing. At the tenth hour, all were gathered at the courtyard as ordered. They were divided into several nondescript teams, each with a variety of members of all races and skills. Kairoth looked around at his group with disappointment. Two women scribes, a priest, a druid, a couple of hunters, two warriors of unknown proficiency, and a squirrely little person he knew had to be a thief. The championship team this was not. Saliabak picked up on his dis his disapproval. What are you looking at? She snapped. Kairoth just snorted and turned away from her uh, scowl. Nothing. Sophia chimed in. Likewise. Kairoth turned and remarked, Go back to scribbling in your little book, tiny person. I only fight men and hold on women. You are not worthy. Of, you are not a worthy opponent. Sophia reached into her pouch, but Saliabak grabbed her pouch, but Saliabak grabbed her wrist. There will be a time, but it is not now, sister. So Sophia relented angrily, twisting her face and glaring at the Hodon warrior. Rainier watched and had no inhibitions. What's wrong, my companions? We're on an adventure to serve the needs of the goddess. We're all on the same side. Why fight amongst ourselves? He reasoned with the three. Valtier inject, uh, interjected, Um, Rainier, can you come here for a minute, please? Valtier sensed the Hodon warrior was ready to crush his smaller friend. Rainier smiled and turned, walking back to Valtier. What's the matter, brother? Valtier pulled him close. He's hold on, so he's always going to be angry. They're probably mages, but he's too dim to see that, so angering them will end badly. I heard those women sent an elf to the medical tents this morning. Rainier's eyes widened with intrigue. Human mages who can best an elf? Excellent! He looked at the ladies, saying this statement much too loud. Valtier put his face in his hands. What am I going to do with you? Will you never shut up? The two other, the other warriors, excuse me, the other warrior members of the band sat quietly. Two rangers appeared to know the two rangers appeared to know each other, while the other warrior had gravitated over to Kairoth and was conversing with him civilly. Apparently, he was a Hodon birth all, also. Off in the corner, a beaten younger human, sat, uh, a human of around sixteen, sat eating something. He was avoiding eye contact with anyone who looked his way. Kairoth wondered where he had stolen it from. You, the Hodon warrior, pointed at the thief. Why are you here? You're a criminal, aren't you? The young man looked up, up with a weathered face. What is it to you? I was ordered here just as you were. Mind your own business. He went back to eating his food and Kairoth began to advance to the challenge of the lad when the horns uh, started blaring. Alright. As if by instinct, all of the groups became, became silent. Each group stood in circles of ten men, ten members. They all faced the stone platform that was raised ten feet above them. Very shortly after the horn blast, Master Donick and the king appeared on the landing. All eyes were on the duo. Excuse me. Donick spoke. All of you here today have shown promise 
in your arts. You have defeated your peers in every test. You stand here chosen to take on the work, real work of the kingdom. You will aid in the restore, restoration of peace and prosperity for all mortal kind. Your Majesty, Donic bowed and gave the stage to Piran backing out of view. The sun gleamed off of Piran's elfish mail, and his garb was a bright white and blue. He stood beside four ban standard bear bearers who held the four banners of Islandeth, Hodon, Torith, and Dornot Alar. Excuse my nose is itching. The wind caught them and they fluttered as if on cue for effect. The king represented the interests of all the Northern Alliance. Purin spoke with an authoritative voice. All of you here are the best of our na that our nation has to offer. There is a new evil in our lands among our people. The scourge of the Underlord has been de defeated. But now greed, avarice, and extortion rule the three nations of to the south. Within our own borders, persecution of those who we once held as brothers and sisters, sisters is rampant, and travel is perilous even during the daylight hours. Piran looked at each face out before him. There were ten groups of ten, one hundred more faces to add to the thousands he saw in his dreams every night. He frowned and composed himself. We must work to preserve the light. We must restore security to our people for all, from all backgrounds. We must put down the lawlessness, lawlessness that seeks to destroy what we are rebuilding. You will be the tools that build this future. The groups around them cheered as the king saluted and then departed. Even the rangers and the other Hodon warrior of the Kairoth's group lifted a fist in approval. Kairoth looked at the mages in the circle. They had the same look of apathy on their faces. Oh, excuse me, i got to get to my eyeball. Excuse me. <clears throat> all three chuckled as they realized they were probably thinking, all thinking the same thing. The guards began ex escorting all of the candidates to their separate living quarters in another private tent complex nearer to the monastery. They would not get to their group for a while. Perhaps you are not as dim as I thought, Sophia stated, looking away from Kairoth. Kairoth could see in her satchel. There were herbs and strange bits of this and that in small containers. Immediately he, re he realized she was a mage. Smiling, he responded, and apparently I misjudged your profession, he remarked, nodding at the reagents in the mage's sack. Sophia grabbed her bag and tied it securely, making a face at the warrior. Oh, good, you're getting along, Rainier remarks joyfully. Seemingly, the druid acted as if he thought that all were going, that they were all going off on some retreat for a little holiday. This annoyed Valtir to no end. The three looked at the druid uh, curiously. Sophia shook her head. What is wrong with that one? I am not. I, I am wrong. Why? Because I choose not to be angry and disgruntled? I believe the goddess has me right where she wants me to be. I believe that about all of us. Our adventure will prove our beliefs through our actions, and all that, uh, and that is all that I desire. I wish to serve the goddess and not to just to, to talk about it. Valtir interrupted. My apologies, my friends. He is very enthusiastic at times, but he means no harm. Rainier sighed. I'm not a doddering fool who needs you to make excuses for me, brother. He relied with annoyance. He replied with annoyance. I can speak for myself. <clears throat> Valtir waved him off with one hand. As you wish. Everyone went off to sit, and for a time the group all sat quietly. Uh, but when the introductions began, much to Valtir's dismay, it was Rainier who spoke first. The priest started to started to worry less about surviving the adventures ahead, and instead pondered whether or not they would survive their first day together. Only time would tell, but no one was injured yet. Alright, that was chapter four, uh, three, excuse me, chapter three, <clears throat> and I am about 33 minutes into it. I haven't seen anybody, I see a couple people, oh, it looks like they're watching from the side, but nobody's commenting in the, uh, what do you call it, in the, in the comments, so at least I have a couple people watching. Hi, peeps! <clears throat> oh, I lost one. Damn. Must have scared him away. Okay, I'm not looking. Nobody's watching. I don't want to scare anybody away. All right, anyway. So, basically, the team has been formed in Chapter 3. Chapter 4. I'm going to start on it. The sun rose red on the horizon. Piran sat with Donick as he had for, four, for the past two weeks, looking out over the reconstruction. The, the pair could see the foundation of the old city materializing as if by magic, but both knew that thousands of souls, both military and civilian, were toiling day and night to raise the walls that they that they would once uh, one day inherit. Wow, I'm making tongue twisters everywhere. The king resolved to not resurrect the king resolved to not only resurrect the grey stones of his childhood, but also the dream that was Islanda's splendor. 
and I need a drink. It's good. Ah. Well, that does it, Your Majesty, the Master said, adding a few jots to the text and rolling up the long scroll. All teams have been matched to their missions that best suit their skill set. Pierre looked off at the color-coded tent complexes as a twinge of guilt hit, an old familiar tightness in his chest and throat, contemplating sending off his charges to die in foreign lands. Watching as the teams practiced in specially created facilities, the king was torn about what he was setting them out to do. The warriors, mages, priests, and specialists were becoming coordinated. They would soon be instruments of their king's will, and the enemies of the light would not be happy to meet them. Be sure that we issue them all that they need, Donick, the king said, staring off in thought. Of course, your majesty. We will equip them with the appropriate armor, weapons, and provisions. Donick wrote a note on the parchment to remind him himself of the king's orders. Horses. Give them horses, Donick. We, don't, we do have enough, don't we? The king asked. Oh yes, Corrin has war horses, your majesty. But may I suggest riding horses to maintain an anonymity? They would be seen coming from miles if riding a Corinian war horse. No commoner would be able to afford such a fine animal. The master looked at the king inquisitively. Yes, to remain, to maintain an illusion of normalcy. Give them riding horses. Make sure that they are sturdy steeds. They may need to travel far. One never knows. The king turned and smiled. Donick, give them their best chance, please. Of course, your majesty. I will do my best. Pyrrha left the room at the monastery and made his way down to the throne room. There he sat and sipped a mug of mead. His guilt was eating away at him. He wondered while looking out, the, over, looking out over the muddy tent city before him whether Swick had ever felt as he, had, as he did now. Nodding, he finished the last swallow. Of course he did. It's my turn now. The quartermaster was dismayed by the long line of rabble before him. One hundred men, women, elves, dwarves, and half-bloods were in line with scripts to draw gear. One by one, with the help of several duty guards, the sergeant issued each new conscript a backpack, provisions for two weeks, clothing, a small tent, field bedding, appropriate armor, and weapons. Then, checking the order twice, the steward shook his head as he issued a, as he issued a script to each for an average riding horse with all required tack and harness and saddlebags. <clears throat> each new tent team member stuffed everything into the pack and went to the stables chit in hand to get their horse. <laughs> After drawing their horses, the team split into their own groups. No one knew the other, and that was by design. Each team's objectives were also kept secret. One hand knew not what the other was up to. The groups all gathered and set their equipment in the appropriate places. Kairoth and his team looked impressive once outfitted with their issued equipment. The warriors were all dressed in hauberks of chain. And as was the priest. The, the druid preferred leather, and after many protests, he was issued what he asked for. The mages declined the bulky armor, but were given quality clothing instead. Kairoth knew, the, the, knew that although the two women were not as proficient as, the, as, as his men in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they had other ways of protecting themselves. No one questioned their ability to inflict mass casualties if given the opportunity. Kairoth assumed le uh, leadership, and no one in the group seemed to protest. He was a natural leader, and after a couple of weeks, he had shown the most tactical promise of any in the group. Surprisingly, the young Hodon warrior was not as hard-headed as the mages had first thought, and he further surprised them by consulting his team with concerning many decisions. All the members were valued, and that led to a quick unification. The group became one entity, complementing each other's strengths while covering each other's weaknesses. We are to leave immediately for a hero's pass? Valtira questioned. Yes, that's what the orders are, Kairoth replied seriously. Is that a problem? Well, no, friend, but do any of you know where the village is? Valtir said inquisitively. Saliabak interrupted. I believe it's somewhere southeast of the city, somewhere near Raven's Pass. I'm told that it's a half-blood elfish settlement, relatively new, I do believe. One of the rangers outside the immediate conversation shook his head. Half-blood toads, what are, the, what are their problems to us? Why do they sa why don't they saddle up and defend the very pe why do we saddle up to defend the very people who abandoned us when they were most needed? Ro Roland spat. The other range ranger nodded in agreement. The thief sat up and spoke, which was a rarity. They're people, you asses. They just want to live in peace and they're being kidnapped. Perhaps you dim witted bigots such as perhaps by dim witted bigots such as yourselves. The specialist, specialist was visibly annoyed and then stood up. He was a good six, six inches shorter than either of the, the bowmen. 
Besides, the king ordered us to go there. Apparently, he thinks they matter. Go tell Purin to his face if they don't. Or shut your mouths and get in line like the rest of us. Kairoth raised an eyebrow and stood up, stood as one of the rangers made a move towards the smaller thief. There will be none of that, brothers, or you'll answer to me. Roland scowled, mumbling in an unintelligible curse, sitting back down on a hay bale that he rose from. Kairoth looked over at Famlin with a grin on his face. The warrior shook his head. The specialist nodded back in appreciation for the warrior's backing. Any other objections? If so, let's get it out in the open. We do not like to have. We do not have to like who we are saving, or what our mission is. We simply need to get it done. Then get back, get get paid, and get to relax for a time before we're called upon again. Kairoth looked at all the faces around him. All nodded in unison, even the reluctant rangers Roland and Brynn. Rainier had an overly cheery face and his uh, cheery smile on his face as usual. Let's see. Kairoth, before we depart, I have been given leave to enter the sanctuary and pray. It is a great honor for a common priest, such as I. I cannot pass it up. Please do not be offended. Valtier looked embarrassed. I understand. I will visit the monuments of Swick and Ontok as you visit your holy place. All of us need to prepare and make peace with our gods and our lives. We know not what the future may hold. We may we meet back here at the seventh hour of the day. Kairoth stood and saluted his comrades, who acknowledged and returned the gesture, breaking the circle to attend to their personal needs. <clears throat> Purin ordered a meter dispersal of each group. Donick made sure that to let three to five teams leave at a time. Every group in a different direction. The dispersal looked like looked to those on the outside as if it was increased traffic as if the increased traffic was just a bunch of, imp of supply caravans duty guard rotations or travelers who had decided to travel in numbers with the highwaymen and brigands that ran rampant in the king's highways no one questioned the logic by the ninth hour of the day Kairoth and his team were dispatched quietly southeast the group was dressed as if they were common Iceland subjects but most of them were on mounts and in armor, so despite the attempted ruse, the average person in Islan thought of them to be at least lesser nobility or part of an affluent merchant class. The most common theory of the average person encountering the team was that the two ladies in the center of the traveling group must be of some importance because they had their own priest, a small contingency of private security, and a small contingency of private security. People on the road gave them a wide berth. The team traveled for hours, making it far enough away from Empire that the fires of the city were a distant grayness on the tree line's horizon. At the thirteenth hour of the day, the sun was dipping low when the group looked for a place to hastily set up camp. Pulling fifty measures off the main road, the rangers found a suitable place to pitch the tents and start a small fire. Within the hour, the camp was set up. We need to set the watch schedule, Roland remarked to the other ranger. He had been in the rough many times and before and knew that dangers could creep up in the darkness on an unguarded party. Yeah, good call, Roland, Brynn replied, the two grabbed forearms in a salute that only the draws use, usually used. The two, who had, the two had trained in Torith before the repatriation had begun. When the cultural reset started, they both were shunned and qui quietly run out of the kingdom of the elves, making their way back to Empire, only to end up joining Purin's crusade. They too knew what it felt like to be refugees. Being uprooted from the only home that either had ever known, the two resented the elder races for their own personal reasons. Kairoth, who do you want on watch? Roland requested. The woman sl should sleep. Mages, Kairoth began. Saliabak in interrupted angrily. The women? Mages, is that better? You're both women. For the love of the gods, relax. Kairoth shrugged. He did not understand what the mage's problem was. Sophia rolled her eyes. Fine, sister, who cares? We get to sleep. I'm fine with that, as long as these buffoons can keep a watch. Bryn loud, uh, laughed loudly. A fine trip this will be. Off to save the, to save the toads with a charming pair of ladies who never cease to speak like asps. Perhaps I should stop speaking and seal your lips permanently, Saliabak said with a scathing stare. The ranger laughed again. So pretty, but so angry. He, he wisely walked away, disappearing into the darkness. The party could not see him within seconds. I'll take the first watch, he said from outside the side of the camp. I'll take the se second, brother, Roland replied, pulling out a bedroll. I'll take the third, Kairoth said, watching the two with curiosity. I want to stand a watch, Rainier said excitedly. May I stand it with you, Bryn? Sure. Just shut up and stay out of sight, will you? The ranger appeared from as if from thin air entering the camp. You stay within the fire firelight. I will explore the darkness. Understood? Sounds like a good plan. I'm ready. 
Rainier sm smiled like a boy who had just won a prize. The ranger sighed deeply and disappeared into the darkness from where he had came. How does he do that? Kairoth walked over to Roland Draj. Uh, walked over to Roland Draj. No, the elves ev evicted us before we could test. We would have made it, I'm certain. It's all I, we ever wanted to be. Now we're hired men. So, so much for the dream of dreams of glory and on, honor and glory. Roland turned to a small tent and grabbed a water skin, drinking from it sparingly. Okay. There was all. There is always tomorrow, brother. Honor waits for you with the dawn. You cannot. They cannot take it from you. You must take it yourself. Kairoth looked as if he had gained thirty years as he spoke, then smiled, and he was eighteen years again. Eighteen again. The ranger nodded, smiling. How are you not an ass? You're, you're a hold on. Well, we are not our labels. We define ourselves by what we do and who we say we are. Kairoth nodded and went back, went to his tent to sleep. Where is the thief? Valtier asked, checking the horses. I don't know, Rainier. Uh, Rainier said, looking furiously around the camp. Did we lose him? Hardly. That one's sneaky. Well, I guess that's his job. I wonder what he's up to. Valtier squinted, looking off into the dark, the gathering darkness. After a couple of hours, the fire, down, fire died down a bit, and the party went to sleep, except for the two who were on watch. <clears throat> Next scene. Uh, taking a sip. It was near midnight when Sophia inevitably felt the need to use the privy. Anybody that's in the SCA knows that if you go to bed about 8, 39 o'clock because you're old and you're tired... While all the drummers are drumming and everybody's partying and having a good time, you will wake up anywhere from 12 midnight to 2 o'clock in the morning in the cold having to piss like a racehorse. So, that's where I got this idea from. Life experiences, that makes a book easy to write. Trust me, if you've done crazy stuff like been in the Marine Corps, been in the SCA for like 30 years, um, I don't know, had a crazy job like a cop or a, a firefighter or medical person, EMT type guy, you will have experiences that you can put into anything. You just have to change the circumstances a little bit, and they apply. It's freaking hilarious sometimes that people like read my book and go, really, dude? That's the rifle range. I'm like, yeah, I know, isn't it? It's funny, it's funny huh? And then they're like, actually, you did really good. It's really cool. In the first book, I did that really a lot. The second book, eh, a little bit here and there, but... All right, so Sophia's got a P. It's midnight, so let's get back to the P story. It's not going to be that kind of a story, so everybody just calm down, just settle down. It was near midnight when Sophia inevitably needed, felt the need to use the privy. She slipped out of her bedroll, shivering. It was cold. It was a cold night of 40 degrees. She exhaled. The mage could see her breath misting before her. Grabbing a small spade, she made for the nearby tree line to find a secluded spot to do her business. Do -do -do. Clicking on stuff. <clears throat> the moon was full and Sophia could see the tent outline clearly against the fire's light. She smelled the crisp night air and burning wood. Finding a perfect spot, she sunk the blade into the soft, soft earth soft earth, and dug a small hole, squatting, she began. While relieving herself, Sophia was startled, hearing something of size moving within the dark wood. What was that, she said under her breath. Without a torch, she could not see into the dark, into the blackness. Sophia was frozen in vigilance. Fear was slowly making its presence known. Its presence known as she felt adrenaline pump into her, begin to pump into her breast. She was sure that she had heard a deep panting and a low growl, but she could not see where it was coming from. It was close. She then she saw a dark blur run in, run within the tree line in front of the background of the lit camp. Pulling down her long tunic, she grabbed a shovel in her hand, making a looking for a hint of where the growling blur had gone. Gone. When she was sure that it was out of it was not in her immediate vicinity. Sophia bolted for the camp, screaming loudly. <coughs> hey, what's up, Brent? Yay, somebody showed up. Yay. I've had somebody watching me from the from the background. I don't know who it is, but I'm, I appreciate you too. I just don't know who you are. Sorry. Oh, how did I escape the nut house and got some grub in me? <laughs> oh, sorry about that, man. You know, crazy, the crazy house. Yeah, I, 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 I get it. I'll be there tomorrow. All right, where was I saying? Uh... I lost my place. Okay, I gotta find my place again. Uh, Sophia bolted for the camp, screaming loudly. That's what that's what was going on. Uh, help! Help! Something is after me. She looked like a pale specter floating through the field as she ran, shovel in hand. 
Valtier, Rainier shrieked as if he had seen a ghost. The, un the undead attack us. Valtier sat up in the tent. What? He ran out the he ran into the camp to see the running mage. Confused, he looked at Rainier, who was armed with a cudgel. Wait, that's the mage, the younger one. Do not hit her, you dimwit. Oh, well, I thought she was asleep in her tent, not off communing with nature at this time of night. What was she doing out there? What is that? Rainier pointed at a dark, furry creature that was now bounded across the field towards the mage in the camp. It was moving quickly and making a beeline for the fire pit. Kairoth, now up, had his draw sword drawn. He was moving with purpose towards the dark, charging black mass. <clears throat> As the mage sprinted into the firelight and ran into her tent to find her reagents, Rainier opened his eyes wide and running towards Kairoth. Kairoth? 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 Kairoth. Wait! Kairoth turned to see the druid who was yelling at him. Right about the time, the furry, man-sized creature knocked the hold-on warrior over as it bounded towards one of the backpacks, tearing it open in one try. Kairoth ran to attack the brown bear that was in the team's camp. It was not an overly large creature, but it was definitely a threat and very unwelcome. The druid ran up and stood in front of the warrior, pleading, Wait, hold for a minute. Let me try something first. Out of my way, druid, the angry hold-on protested. Fine. Kill the baby bear. You kill the baby bear, you anger the mother. Do you want the mama bear? That's how you get the mama bear. Maybe several. Rainier spoke angrily, as if the warrior should know this. Kairoth relaxed. Fine. Do whatever it is you do, but do it quickly. Oh, and you will replace my rations for the bear's life. You will do this. That damn thing ate all of my food. And uh, Rainier smiled and turned to mutter words with his eyes closed. Then he approached the bear and began to speak as if it were another person who he had met at the market. Hello, my name is Rainier. Why are you here? The bear turned, looking at the young druid, then sat like a puppy with a growl. Well, we don't have much to eat here. Maybe in the woods you can find more food. Where's your mother? Rainier asked calmly. The bear growled sadly and then angrily. Rainier looked at Kairoth. He says he's hungry and that hunters or something separated him from his mother. I should help him find his mother or he'll keep doing this sort of thing. I will be back later. Kairoth looked at the cur looked curiously at the druid. Be careful. Then he turned and looked at Sophia. I'm taking half of your rations. Then he turned and looked at Sophia. I'm taking half of your rations, Rainier, stupid bear. And you, young lady, could you please let the watch know when you are leaving camp? It would be a good idea in the future. Sophia nodded sheepishly. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It won't happen again. Then she ducked into her tent, clutching her shovel. Good night. Rainier and tap Rainier on uh, Rainier tap on the on the boot I might need your skill friend would you be willing to come with me to find the mother Brind woke to a sigh well after that racket who can sleep let me get my bow <clears throat> the two let the bear let the two let the bear lead them back to where it lost its mother while Rainier spoke to the bear with all, all the way there nice trick priest Brind remarked following the surrounding terrain attentively then he picked up a trail I think I can track her from here Excellent, Rainier exclaimed, and related the story to his new furry friend. The morning sun hung low and the red and red in the sky. It was mildly humid, but the clouds were beginning to arrive from the south, and the wind pushed them quickly into the vicinity. It was cold, and it now looked like rain. Kairoth looked up wondered, and wondered what he had done to anger the gods. Then looking around for the druid and the ranger, then he looked around for the dru druid and the ranger. Wonderful. Where in the underworld are those two? The warrior complained. We can't wait here all day. The other Hodon warrior called Donzu reported in. Nothing yet, brother, but I'm looking on the tree line for anything coming our way. I will let you know if I see anything. Donzu, there, near the cosp, right below the tree line. Two on foot, Metadel shouted. Donzu looked over at the Islam warrior, looking to where his... Uh, Danzo ran over to the Islam warrior, looking where his partner now, point, now pointed. It was them. Thanks, brother, Danzo said to Metodel, who kept an eye on the two as they approached. They appeared to be running. Kairoth, they come, Danzu stated. Ha the Hodon leader nodded, nodded. Well, it's about damn time. Within moments, a winded pair of men entered the, ca the, the camp that was almost completely torn down. They had their hands on their knees and were sucking wind hard. Kairoth approached them with a dis in a disapproving manner. Well, Druid, was it worth it, he said sarcastically. Actually, in my opinion, yes, the, the exhausted Druid responded tersely. <clears throat> Brind immediately set, up, set about breaking down his tent and packing his belongings. Valtira had taken the liberty of tearing down Rainier's camp and made sure to let him know about it. 
Nice of you to join us. And now are you the envoy to the bear population of the Earth? Volunteer smirked, rolling his eyes. I reunited a child with his mother while you slept. I call that a win. Rainier grabbed a pack and grabbed his pack and threw it up on his horse, yawning. Thanks for packing, by the way, but I can manage. You're not my wife. He laughed as he saw the scowl on Voltaire's face while the priest, the priest searched for his mind for an appropriate response. Shaking his head but not emitting, not emitting, not emit, uh, to, you know, well, one second. Okay, I think my brain's caught up. Shaking his head but not admitting defeat, Voltaire turned and mounted his horse, joining the others. Ah, there we go. I had to wait for... Hey, what's up, Tommy? How you doing, brother? <clears throat> Enough. Get the camp packed and let's get on the road. It's already the third hour of the morning. We are not on sabbatical here. Kairoth, hands, hands on hip, looked at the two clergy members with impatience. The group of travelers made his last made their, made their last preparations and then left down, left down the road, traveling southeast towards their objective, the village of Heroes Pass. Woo! All right, I think I need a drink. I got two people watching in the background, and I got two people on my page. I'm I'm doing good now. Ah. It was the twelfth hour of the day when Roland finally saw a small village to the south of the road. It was only a couple of miles away, but the ranger could already make out the night fires being lit. Smoke in a small gray smoke in rows in small gray chalk lines into the darkening sky. This was definitely an organized settlement, Vice Camp. He rode back to where Kairoth was. Settlement on the southeast. I think it is the place that we are looking for. Roland pointed to the now obvious fires that were visible on the broad, open terrain of this part of the kingdom. Whew. Excuse me. Not much, Tommy. Just uh, doing what everybody else is doing. Working, trying not to get sick, and read my book because I'm trying to avoid all the drama of the news and just escape into my story and I'm glad you joined me uh, hopefully you know people watch the video after I, I read this uh, the rest of this chapter and keep up to date because this book it moves pretty quickly so anyway let's see settlement to the southeast I think it's the place we're looking for Roland pointed towards the now obvious fires that were visible on all visible to all on the broad open terrain of this part of the kingdom agreed let's make haste to get there by nightfall. I do not want to camp in the rough again if at all, if at all possible. Kairoth's statement was met by instant approval from both mages. Rainier was barely upright in the saddle. I need some sleep. Kairoth laughed. I will bet that you do. He looked at Voltaire sighing. Voltaire returned his sigh. To the north of the road, a rider approached their position. The rangers readied their bows, and Kairoth had his hand in the sword hilt. It was quickly determined that Famelin was rejoining the group. From his overnight of an overnight absence, Kairoth was interested. Where have you been, specialist? Kairoth asked suspiciously. You have to order the well, if you're gonna order the new book, like I was saying, you might have to do an ebook order for now, because with all this virus crap, my publisher is not essential, so I don't think they're printing right now. So unless the the book is actually in stock at Barnes and Noble or in stock at uh, at uh, Amazon or wherever you're going to buy it. If they have to order from I Ingram Spark, it might take a couple months. So I don't know because they're behind on everything. So there's going to be a big mess. Hey, Patch, I don't know if you're one of the guys in the background, but I see your, your like and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so if you want the book, the ebook is actually available on Amazon, $4.99, I think. And then it's the same thing at uh, at uh, Barnes and Noble. But look at both of those because they like to fight with each other on price, and sometimes they'll drop it down a few, you know, a few percentage points. All right. Well, I'm gonna get back to the story and get my butt in gear here because we don't have too many pages left. But I don't know. This, these chapters, yeah, chapter four is kind of a long one. Yeah, got a few. Another seven. Another seven pages, and I'm done for the night. It's only been an hour, so hey, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, it's it sucks, but. You know, publishers are gonna. You know, we. Hey, what's up, Aaron? We can't even make toilet paper now, right now, and factories. So printing books is, <laughs> excuse me, probably not on the high. You know, the high paper, uh, shipping whatever uh, priorities right now of the country. So yeah, you can get the ebook though. The ebooks uh, is it. 
I like reading a real book, but you know, hey, I read ebooks, so the ebooks are available. And the first and second books are, you can get both the books on ebook for the price of one paperback of either one. So you can't beat it. I made the ebooks as cheap as I possibly could. I'm thinking of dropping the price of the second book in the next few months, probably down to three, two or three, two ninety nine or three ninety nine, because it, the third book I got to work on that one. That's the next one. Time up, time to break out the corn. <laughs> oh Lord, help us! Dried corn cobs. That's gotta feel good. Yeah. All right. Well, I got to refill here. Hold on. Excuse me while I'm uh, not doing a commercial for any apparent any types of whiskey, but. I am just pouring myself some it, it, whiskey of the Gaelic type. Yes, I like that kind. I lost a person. Oh, no. Anyway. All right. Back to the reading. Let's go. Um, they found the village. Okay. Rainier was barely in the tail. Okay. The north of right. Where have you been, specialist? Kairoth asked suspicious, suspiciously. Relax, oh fearless leader. I was on reconnaissance. Famlin responded in an or irritated manner. I'm doing my job. Well, let me know next time, or somebody at least. Did you see anything interesting on your evening ride? Kairoth waited. Well, actually, yes. Ah, i got to move this camera down so I can actually lean forward, because nobody can see me if I lean forward. All right, whatever. I'll fix it tomorrow or next time. Anything interesting on your evening ride? Kairoth waited. Well, actually, yes. On the north side of the Ravens Pass, there appear to be some mid-sized camps of militias. Of militia. Family was now surrounded by interested party members. I counted 50 men ages 50, 15 to 50. Some on for horseback. <laughs> some on horseback, but mostly on foot. Arms and armor look pretty substandard, so I'd say brigands for sure. Well, you would know, Roland said with a sneer. Brynn chuckled softly, softly. Ignoring the slight, family continued. There's a beaten path into the ridge on the north side of the pass, but I lost it in the mountainous region. I could have used one of you wannabe elves to track that. The comment stung, and both the rangers were not amused. One started to speak, but family continued. I did notice something strange up there. The trees looked dead, and no wildlife appeared to be within the area. I've never seen anything like it before. Rainier looked puzzled. No wildlife at all? Nothing. Not even a bird, Famlin responded. <clears throat> Where did I go? That is definitely not good. I should like to investigate that situation and report my findings to Her Holiness, the Queen. Rainier became oddly serious when talking about the forest and the Queen. No one mocked his demeanor. Well, after we deal with the brigands, we can look at your forest, Druid. Will that suffice? Kairoth offered. Yes. Thank you. Rainier was oddly silent and had a worried look on his face. Kairoth almost missed his cheerful banter, wondering what was wrong. He, was, he merely nodded, and R Rainier responded in kind. The team regrouped and continued on the dirt road. Within two hours, they were met by a farmer. They were met by a farmer. La la la. They were met by a farmer. Ah, man. Words. Ah, blah, 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 blah. The team regrouped and continued down the dirt road. Within two hours, they were met by a farmer claiming to be a sentry. Hold there. Who are you? The half-elf asked in an intimidating voice as he could muster. Kairoth stifled a desire to laugh, but before he could answer, Sollybach said, My sister and I are ladies of moderate means who travel to Torth for magic and reagents training. Magic reagents and training. These gentlemen are a traveling party. She pointed to, out to each member. We have clergy for spiritual guidance and healing if necessary, and of course, guides and security personnel. Salibach fanned herself pretentiously, eliciting a look of amusement from Kairoth. It is so unsafe on the roads these days, she said, batting her eyelids. The guard leaned on his boar spear. Agreed, my lady. Perhaps you should stay the night in our small inn. It is but a common room, but warm and much more secure than sleeping in the rough. Is it true what the rumors say? Saliabak rode up to where the guard now relaxed his posture. She said to him in a loud whisper, Are brigands operating in this locale? She, then she looked uh, she, she looked concerned for good measure. You have heard correctly, my lady. The bastards hit us a few nights ago. They used to only target our crops and mead, but now they appear to be to seek after slaves also. Our women and children are now targeted. We, he frowned. We keep them indoors and under guard now. It is a hard way to live. He, uh, looking toward, he frowned, looking towards the village. Isn't it bad enough that everyone hates us so? Are these men so cruel as to tear our children and wives from us also? 
That sounds atrocious, Sally Box said in actual horror. She was not faking anymore. Perhaps these my men can be of his assistance while we are here. She looked at Kairoth, daring him to contradict her. I consider all who are willing to stand the watch with us to be a friend. He whistled loudly, and two young boys arrived. Take them to the inn. They are travelers. The boys nodded and did as they were told. The horses were secured and cared for in the village corral as the travelers all walked into the small tavern and inn. It was thirty measures by thirty measures. It was a thirty measure by thirty measure mud building with a thatch roof and a hinged wooden door on the side of it. There was a bar to secure the door, but the building was essentially open for business. But the building was essentially always open for business. A hole in the roof acted as a chimney, and a large round stone fire pit was located in the center of the room. The floor was lined with thick, a thick layer of straw. It was warm and dry. There were only two others in the building at the time. One of them spoke. Welcome, me, my lords and ladies. May I get you something to eat or drink? A copper co coin is all it costs. The old lady smiled as she stood. Yes, please, uh, Kairoth responded. Please bring out a male or ale for each of my friends and a serving of the evening fare. He provided the old woman with the, the coin required and a bit extra for her trouble, and she returned with a barley stew and dr the drinks. The party sat and ate their meal, quietly discussing the evening watch schedule. They kept their, di their discussion out of, the mi uh, of their mission quiet because they did not know who was listening. The two rangers drew the first watch. <clears throat> one, of the, one remained indoors and the other positioned himself outside near the horses in the grain storage. Brynn hid, hid as, elvish, as the elves do in plain sight. None of the go local guards knew of his presence. Alright, I'm clicking on some stuff. All right. Why is this thing doing stuff? All right. The horns were blown sometime late into the first watch. Bryn slowly moved towards the sound of the trumpets. Looking towards the tavern, he could see Roland peeking around the door. He was making hand signals to his partner. Bryn responded in kind. Roland gave a thumbs up, acknowledging the order and ducked inside. Get up, Roland whispered as he kicked the, group, the group's membership in their shoes. The brigands are in the village. Bryn is out there ready to engage. Kairoth was up immediately in still in armor. Let's go, team. It's time to earn our paychecks. The two warriors were up and ready within minutes. As the priest shook the druid awake, the mages began mixing components. Five more minutes, Rainier protested and then rolled over. Get your lazy behind up, Valtier said assertively, yanking Rainier's blanket off of him. What is your problem, Rainier asked, bleary-eyed. He had been working on less than three hours sleep in two days. Brigands, remember? Valtier looked at his friend expectantly. Oh, yes, time to work. Rainier sprang to his feet immediately, energized and enthusiastic. Let's get him. Uh, outside, the sound of the horses could be heard off in the distance. Guards were shouting in elfish in to each other. Brind watched from his vantage point, knocking an arrow. As he saw the first marauder, he drew his elfish bow and let the arrow fly. Without looking, he pulled another and let it fly. And another and another. Horsemen were dropping from their horses and regrouping on the ground. The ranger had killed two, but three were still much, still very much alive. The door to the urn, the inn, burst open as three shieldmen stepped out and to the front. Kairoth was in the middle. To his left was Metadel and to his right Danzu. Be behind the wall were two mages with the druid on the right and the priest on the left. The specialist was nowhere to be seen. Kairoth looked around and shook his head. The unit moved as one as they had trained in Empire. The brigand leadership saw this and regrouped its forces. The, the, their leader had at least 10 horsemen left and 20 foot soldiers. Shields, stay together. Stand by for a charge. Watch the horses on the left. Kairoth surveyed the field with enthusiasm. These foes were about to engage something they hadn't bargained for. Kairoth yelled to Roland, Go back up, Brynn. We have it. We have this over here. Then when Kairoth had finished saying this, he felt the air on the back of his neck stand up. Duck! The shield wall hit the ground instinctively, as Saliabak and Safia let loose with a barrage of energy bolts, instantly killing five horsemen and three foot soldiers. Ooh, what the heck just happened there? That was weird. Okay, what happened? Okay, some turned to run, but Roland and Bryn made their run a short trip. Reform, uh, Kairoth commanded as the shield wall re reformed. Forward at a walk, gentlemen, the, the Hodon warrior said. Come and get it, scum. He, sh he shouted at four, uh, toward 15 or so brigands reforming for a charge. Then they came. The brigands hit the shield wall in waves. The priest and the druid fought off any flanking maneuvers, but the majority of the killing came from the front, came from the, shield, the three shieldmen at the front. The mages tried to 
to get off another shot, but because of the mayhem, they were unable to concentrate <clears throat> and utter the proper incantations to make it happen. Both drew daggers and hoped that they would not be forced into physical combat. So far, so good. Up front, the ill-equipped forces of the brigands crashed against the two angry Hodon and one motivated Islandeth warrior. The Island warrior made it a personal goal to kill as many as the other two because he felt the honor of his homeland was at stake. Tearing through the rabble that presented itself, the trio left a gruesome trail of gore and death. A few in the distance ran back towards where the camp was reported to be, just as the party thought that, that they would escape and bring reinforcements. Three distinct, distinct screaming voices were heard out of sight, then two, then one, and then silence. Ro Brynn and Roland now surveyed the direction of the screams, their bows and, the bows out and strings drawn, <clears throat> drawn back. Through the mist of the light evening fog, they saw a small man or boy advancing on the village. He was coming in fast and light. He looked as if he was a skilled scout. The rangers let loose their arrows. The figure disappeared. Damn you two, a, a familiar voice screamed. Are you both blind? Who is that? Roland remarked loudly at the invisible person. It's me, you horse's ass. Famlin, you're specialist. I need a doctor now, please. Famlin was frantic. Oh no, Bryn said, uh, said with concern. I hope we didn't kill him. Yeah, that would not be ideal, Roland quipped. We are, we are coming for you. Do not shoot us or whatever it is you do. Hurry up and bring the priest, you fools, Famlin pleaded. Valtier hurried out into the field. I'm coming as fast as I can. Hang on. That when Valtier had arrived, he could see that Famlin had two arrows in him, one in his belly and the other through his left thigh. He was in extreme pain and losing blood quickly. Valtier called out to Rainier, who brought him his medical kit. Carefully, he the, carefully the two removed the arrows from their friend, binding the the wounds the best they could, uh, uh, best that, that they could along the way. Valtier pulled out a green vial with an elfish symbol on it and applied to Famlin's abdominal injury. His prayers resulted in the expected healing, but they were still required to carry the thief back to the inn. He was in no condition to walk. Where did you go? Kairoth demanded groggily. Famlin responded, I set traps in the field where I thought they would come. I set caltrops for their horses. When they tried to run, they were ensnared, and I dealt with them personally. I was returning when these two asses shot me. Who in the underworld were you... How in the underworld were we supposed to know it was you, you damned fool? Roland protested. Bryn nodded in agreement. I don't know, but I didn't have time to check out with you all when the action started. I did what I do. I killed five in total. They are fallen in the field where you shot me unless the enemy carries off their dead, but I don't think there was enough left to carry anyone off. We did a fine job, family coughed. Enough talk. Rest and heal. Priest, give him a potion. We need him on his feet tomorrow at the latest. The enemy will come back here for retaliation. We need to travel to, down the Raven's Pass and try to draw them out. They will try to ambush us there, and that's when we'll have have them right where they right where we want them. Karath looked almost maniacal when he thought about the battle to come. Valtier raised his hand. What is it, priest? Kairoth responded with irritation. So we're going to intentionally walk into an ambush to draw them out? Are you sure you're going to get hit on the head? Valtier was per perplexed. I'm sure. It's a sound plan. We move it to the side that the enemy is weakest, and then we divide their forces and conquer them. Easy day. Kairoth seemed a bit overconfident after the day's route of the enemy. Never underestimate your foe, brother, Valtier asserted. You do so at your own peril and also ours. Kairoth was annoyed. He immediately recognized that Valtier had quoted from the Book of Hodon Wisdom. He looked at the Valtier with a grave face. I'm clicking. Hillbilly TV. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'll be finding some leaves. <clears throat> Let's see. Don't you worry about that. The plan is sound. Now everyone, come get some sleep. I will take the watch with Rainier. Kairoth turned to Valtier's judging stare and began patrolling. Rainier groaned. He was exhausted. Valtier laughed at him. Serves you right, bear lover. Rainier made a face, then a profane gesture at his brother. Go and get your beauty of sleep, you ogre. Gods know you need it more than I. The groups went back to their bedrolls. Rainier bolted the inn door, and Kairos sat on a bench beside the fire with, a, with mead that the lady of the establishment handed him free of charge. The team was not in bed as bad as he had once thought. In fact, they were much more lethal than he had ever imagined possible. Maybe they would survive to retire, maybe not. But if tonight was any indication of what was to come, many would know their names. That was the more that was more than any Hodon could ever ask for. Retirement would be a bonus. Alright, so I read two chapters, four and five. The team has been formed, sent out on their mission, 
They're down in the village that King Purin wants him uh, wants them to take a look at. They notice some things are going on that the people are dealing with brigands, obviously, because they just encountered them. And then on top of that, they're dealing with uh, uh, something going on with the trees in the north, uh, well, to the Raven Ravens Pass to the north. So uh, next Monday, I'm gonna take a few days off. On Monday, I will start read chapters five and six. And you'll get to see a little bit more of the story. And it just keeps going from here. We've we've seen them walk out. Basically, I reintroduced my characters, set the set the world, and then I went and uh, made the scenario. So the basic ground rules of the world and how they act and everything. Yes, I'm bald. If you didn't know that, surprise. So anyway, um, they. Uh, they're dealing with okay. Basically, Islandith is really pissing off Purin because excuse me, I'm itchy. I don't know what my problem is. I'm really itchy all of a sudden. So Purin's kind of pissed off because they got all these people that are basically acting very bigoted and racist towards the elves and dwarves. But because they feel betrayed by the elves and dwarves because they went back to their homelands uh, when they were needed to help rebuild the human uh, establishments that were destroyed by the offlander invasion in the first book. So now you got Brind, uh, basically the characters in, that we've introduced right now are Kairoth, Ho a Hodon warrior, Salibak, and Sophia, two mages from Edenyag. You've got Famlin, who is your specialist, Brind and Roland, who are both uh, rangers that, are, that were in Torith. They were raised in Torith their whole lives, and they got basically kicked to the curb, just like the humans are kicking the elves to the curb. The elves returned the favor and kicked all the humans out of their area. So Brind and uh, and Roland had to deal with that. Then there's a uh, another Hodon warrior named Donzu. That's you know, Kairos, uh, basically his brother, his friend. They're not related, but he you know he's a fellow Hodon. He's the only other fellow fellow Hodon there. He's got a couple Torith uh, elf wannabe guys. And this is how he thinks right now. He's got two women from Eden Yog. He's got a dude that's probably a Sudan Yog uh, thief. He got uh, two guys from Torith, uh, one Hodon warrior and one Islandith warrior. And he's part Islan, so he kind of tolerates Metadol, who is the other uh, Islan warrior. And and basically, you've met all those people. They've traveled, dealt with the uh, the countryside, which has become it's pretty wild out there. I mean, after the Scourge came in, basically, the offlanders just came in and just wiped all the civilizations off the map. I mean, nature just said, screw it, screw, because nature didn't care. Dogs, cats, lions, tigers, bears, everything's growing out in the out in the wilderness, and, you know, they met a bear. So, I thought that was a... It was a way of showing the powers available to these people. Um, you have very strong warriors, uh, tracking ability of the... Of the uh, the two Draj. Um, if you hear the word Draj, D-R-A-G-A, it is from the first book. The Draj are elfish elites. They are the specialists of the of the uh, the elfish Taurus, Taurith armies. Well, when Purin was trained in Taurith in the first book, it's, uh, there's a whole bunch of the first book and the second book, he became a Draj warrior, which is very rare for a human. They don't usually pick humans. They usually pick elves because elves they, they train them to hide and like you'll see a part in the book where I, a part in the story where I'm talking about how they hid in plain sight. And when they hid in plain sight, that was what the elves they have a spell. It's basically a camouflage spell where they learn it over hundreds of years. Well, Purin learned it, and so did Brind and Roland. They had a really high aptitude, just like Purin. They learned it in a few years, and they might not be as good as the elves are with it, but they're good enough that they basically can walk 100 feet from you and they disappear. And you don't know where they went. You're like, where the hell did they go? And unless you're trained by the, the dwarves or, you know, some other elite force, chances are you're not going to be able to find them. you got to be, like, really good at finding things. It's like, where's Waldo? This guy just, poof, disappears. They don't know where he happened. He's standing right in front of you and shoots you with an arrow. That's how the draws work. They're really good at scouting like that, and uh, and they have a very good ar uh, military unit. Uh, Hodon uses uh, legions, and so does uh, so does pretty much all the human uh, kingdoms. The ar the armies of the d of the dwarves are commandos, 
they're uh, basically they just come out with uh, warhammers. They like warhammers and uh, you know, freaking uh, what's the other thing that the picks and and swords and stuff. They they make all that stuff in the first book. So they're like master metalsmiths, blacksmiths, and all that stuff. Weaponsmiths. That's who makes all the the best metal armor, the best metal weapons, and all that stuff. So they they basically are living under the mountain right now and they're not their military is not really that well built up yet so they're not significantly adding to the story yet so these people that you just met uh you got people two mages two uh two rangers a druidic priest three warriors and a thief all right they're all now in this place called the hero's pass which is a half elf uh uh what do you call it uh settlement made up of all the people that were outcast and uh and uh forced from their homes in various villages all over the place they all traveled there and they made their community and they're being attacked by a group called the red hand and that's why Purin sent the team down there and they've they've handled them pretty well so that's where we left off it was the first encounter with the red hand <clears throat> kairoth is trying to get them to get rested because he figures they're going to come back and try to do a, a what do you call it a, a counterattack because they only got a few of them they got like 20 of them or whatever 25 of them and they only um, Famlin saw 50 but you don't know how many exactly exist because there were several camps in the area and they're north on the other side of the ridge if you look at the the map the way the map is like Empire's up here uh, I gotta move my hands the other way okay we'll say Empire's right here and Raven's Pass is like right here all right and Ravens, and the Ravens Pass is basically it's a it's a it's a long tunnel between some hills, uh, kind of like a like a Grand Canyon Pass, but it's not really deep. You know, it's, you have a couple of small mountains on the side and some a rising mountain to the southwest, but it goes into the open fields of the Arendar and it's on the way to the Torith. I got I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a map of it or you know I'm gonna hold it up so I can point at things so next next so people know what I'm talking about the topography of my uh, topology or whatever cartography of my uh, my book basically right before you get into that pass it takes you over to uh, to the to the open fields of the air um, the, there's that small village called heroes pass well north of the ridge line or, or you know there's the hills is where these camps of uh, bad guys are and they're coming around south on horseback to attack the elves and take their stuff and that is where we left off they're in the inn, getting free booze from the innkeeper for killing a whole bunch of dirtbags that were coming to steal their stuff and possibly kidnap their women and children. Anybody got, anybody got any questions about what I read tonight or anything related to the story at all? <laughs> nope. This thing does not scroll. Tommy wants to be a dwarf. Ah, okay. You can be a dwarf. Well, if I ever make a movie, you know, we'll figure out how to do the uh, the, the makeup. It can be a dwarf. How's that? <laughs> you know, honestly, Tommy, if you want to be an author, shoot. With your life experience in the Navy and everything else, I know you have a lot that you have to offer. So don't sell yourself short. Don't worry about it. Well, I mean, you're a pretty smart dude. You can probably write a coherent sentence. Uh, I, sometimes I write things and I'm like, I have no idea what that means, and I need to rewrite that. So, like, seriously, dude, just write what you want, type it up nice and neat, and find you somebody. I have a, uh, my editor is Hillary uh, Crawford. She's one of my friends on Facebook. Hit her up. She'll see. She'll look it over. And she'll work out a deal with you. You end up paying for your uh, for your proofreading and editing I mean Dave does all that stuff by himself he's up in there uh, Dave's Dave's too smart for me because uh, I can't edit my own stuff because it, it looks terrible when I do so I have a second set of eyes and another brain to look at the uh, to look at my my uh, grammarly corrections because grammarly is my editor before the editor gets it and when my editor gets it she makes me look smarter than I am <laughs> so yeah so yeah whatever you want to write and I, I just suggest that when you write something, it's something you care about and something you have knowledge of. Because I want to write science fiction sometime. But I I know my limitations. I don't know... I know science, but I don't know science. You know what I mean? 
Like, there are people that are much smarter than me out there, and what's going to happen is I'm going to try to write something that is not in line with the laws of physics, and I'm not going to explain it logically, and then some dude's going to read my science fiction book and go, this guy's an idiot. I don't want to read anything more from him because he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's the danger of writing about something that you like, but you don't really know. Fantasy is easy for me because I grew up playing D&D. I do medieval recreation in the SCA, so I understand medieval life to an extent. I understand a hierarchy of, of royalty and, and you know lords and ladies and barons and baronesses and all that. I get that, but I also have the military for a rank structure, so that gave me an idea of you know what's what you know, when it comes to military. <clears throat> so you got military. So you look at what I wrote. What did I write? A fantasy novel based on a medieval society and a lot of my military stuff is in the way they handle things the way they the way they attack things the way the army forms up for formation you should see it you know some of the stuff I'm gonna read people are gonna go that sounds a lot like when we used to be on the boat and that staff sergeant used to yell at us and tell us to fall in yeah no kidding that's where I got it all that's where I got it from I got a lot of my ideas from things I actually did and that's why the story is believable to an extent so yeah if you're gonna write something write something about something you know and you love and you'll kill it I'm sure you will and I'll buy your book I will I'll buy your book so you gotta let me know when you when you write it and, if, and, and, uh, and I'll buy your book so anyway I'm at about an hour and a half it's about what I did last time and I appreciate you guys showing up and for the folks that ghosted in and out I appreciate it it's not a big deal. I get it. Life goes on. An hour and a half of sitting here watching a bald dude run his mouth about his book is sometimes a little bit too much for some people. You can go back and watch the videos, though, if you know, and watch as much as you can take in a chunk with us all sitting in our houses, twiddling our thumbs, waiting for the end of the world to come. Hopefully not. Hopefully we all stay healthy and everything's great. I, I'm just another show on the TV right now. <laughs> So, if you are entertained by my book, hit me up. You'll like, you know, all that other stuff they talk about on videos. I'm going to put these on YouTube. I just haven't got around to it because I've been a lazy bum. I need to get my button gear. But, uh, yeah. So, anyway, one more time for the plug. In the Shadow of the Great White Wall, written by that guy right there. I'm not flipping people off. I don't, can't see what I'm doing with the camera. Austin Belanger. That's me. Anyway, I wrote this book. You can probably get the ebook at Amazon for $4.99 or something like that. And Barnes & Noble sometimes will undercut Amazon, so check them out too. But you have to have a Nook. Uh, or I don't know if there's an app for Nook. But there's an app for a Kindle. If you don't have an actual Kindle, go to the Google Play Store and download the Kindle on your tablet or your phone even. And you can make an account, buy ebooks. A lot of my fellow indie authors will sell their books for a at 99 cents if you're really a big reader there's a thing called amazon uh, kdp that uh, i think dave's involved in it with his books they have a thing called uh amazon what is it called kindle unlimited kindle unlimited is really cool because you you'll spend like 13.99 a month for books but if you're a reader say you read two or three books a month because i know people that are like that they're really big readers an average book costs you like eight or nine bucks, you know, for just a, a commercial paperback. If you buy one this big, I mean, this book costs you like $21 because of the printing and everything. That's one month's freaking subscription to, uh, you know, Amazon, uh, what, what, Kindle Unlimited or whatever. Well, I sound like I'm, I'm not an Amazon employee. I'm just telling you, if you like to read books and you want to read mine, Amazon what, Unlimited or whatever, you can, you can check out thousands of titles that people like like Dave and others that that get involved in the, uh, the KDP program and they, they join the Kindle Unlimited you can read those books for free so anyway I'm done I'm gonna go eat dinner and I hope you all enjoyed the story so far starting to get into the good stuff and I hope you come back on Monday Monday because I keep putting the wrong days on Facebook because it's day and night right now with this craziness going on in the world. I have no idea if I'm coming or going half the time. So, Monday, 5 p.m. to 7. And Wednesday, 5 p.m. to 7. Not Tuesday and Thursday. Monday and Wednesday. I will be reading the book until it's done.
we are already about mm, not sure how many pages are in here we are at chapter five i think which is yeah we're already 60 pages into the book it's a 461 page book so we got a little bit to go the story is getting good and i appreciate you all coming out here to hang with me on a wednesday night i hope you all happy and healthy and i hope you're with the people you love and be safe and god bless and i hope to see you on monday good night